I work for Smart since five years. I can do it in Dutch as well if you want me to do it in Dutch. Um, the, the company was founded in 1998. It's a social enterprise and our aim was to take over the paperwork that was linked to creative entrepreneurship. So what happened is we created a shared company. It was a little non-profit. People come to the office, we fill in the paperwork, and the time that they are working, they can actually become the, um, the employee of SMART. So we take on the role of the employer the time of their mission. They can invoice their clients through our company. They can make up their contract and they can also bring in their expense notes and VAT declarations within the company. Um, that went pretty well, great, and we started having a big membership, but we had one big problem, that was that the paperwork that we were aiming to take over from the artists, we managed to do that, but our team was overwhelmed by the paperwork of the artists. So it started getting a little bit complicated because the business model that we created was not able to scale. And so in the early years of 2000, the decision was made to actually digitalize the whole process, the administrational process. So they created, the founders of Smart created an online platform on which people could log in and autonomously they could make up their billing, their employment contracts, and prepare their expense notes. What we are doing is we take 6.5% on everything that is invoiced through our company. The fact that we do that covers the operational costs that are linked to our IT development, and all the capital surplus is reinvested inside the, the community to make sure that they have access to mutualized services that can ease their entrepreneurship. So the digitalization of the way we operate managed us to operate in a decentralized way, and a lot of our members gained more autonomy. And the time that we were working like that, suddenly we were able to scale the business model, and so to earn more money, and by earning more money, we were able to open up more mutualized services for the artists. Little by little, we also realized that the solutions that we actually made for the artists could suit very well a full range of other freelancers. So little by little, we opened up our services to all autonomous workers. What we are offering is we take care of the payroll, we take care of the expense notes. People can use our VAT number as if it was their own. We have a salary guarantee fund, which means that all of our members are paid within seven days at the end of their mission, even though the client didn't pay the invoice yet. We are taking care of the debt collection. We do microfinancing on projects. Every one of our member has a personal advisor. They can come to the office for legal advice, we offer training sessions, and since a few years, we are also investing in workspaces. So what we're, what we're aiming for is trying to bring back collectiveness amongst individual entrepreneurs. Uh, to give you a few numbers, we have 90,000 members here in Belgium and that represent 100,000 clients from all sectors of activities. And our members last year invoiced through our company 136 million euros. That are the numbers for Belgium. We are also operating in eight other European countries. And it's interesting to notice that in the eight European countries that we're operating, we are actually a co-op. And the reason why we are a co-op in the other countries is because we realized at the moment that we were starting our European development that the best legal structure for us to operate was a co-op. It gives uh, freedom to the workers. They are able to unite. They can earn their own working tools. And there is a democratic governance uh, inside the structure. And as soon as the decision was made to 
go through a co-op development in Europe, we knew that we will, would have to convert the Belgian structure into a co-op as well. But that was a very complicated matter because we exist since almost 20 years. We have a huge membership and we are still running on a daily basis. So the conversion was something that was really, really complicated. And we were very aware that the level of participations of our members was very various. They didn't all have the same disponibility or the same willingness to participate, participate, to participate in, the, in the conversion. And so what we did is, first of all, we communicated about the fact that we were willing to transform into a co-op. We explained why we were not a co-op, so it's important to know that we grew organically. So SMART started as a little non-profit, like every company that would be set up tomorrow in the cultural sector. It grew quickly, it scaled quickly, and by the fact that it scaled quickly, the needs of our members were growing and growing, and we needed more complicated legal structures to actually host the solutions that we were uh, providing. And to oversee that, we created a foundation that was actually overseeing all the legal structures that we've created underneath. And so now we need to explain why we did that, and we need to find ways to go towards a co-op. So that was in 2014 that the decision was taken. We took a year to see really how we would go about that process and the questions that emerged. Those questions were divided into four working groups. So we have mutualization, a co-op for who and with who. How are we going to do about the, the participatory factor of the company? And with which tools are we going to do that? So we divided that into uh, two main, um, main ways of working. We had digital tools and we had real life um, experience to participate. So the lowest level of participation was possible through a simple survey on the website, on the platform of our members. Then there was the online forum for people who had more questions and who wanted to go uh, a little bit more in depth and who were easy with a, a digital interface. The highest level of the digital participation were the writings, so people could actually write on one of those topics or accepted to be interviewed uh, on one of these topics and those interviews and writings were then published on the website. The second part of our transformation was real life experience. We are very great believers that digital tools will never be enough to actually govern democratically an organization. And so we did a lot of small talks. Everybody could go and see their advisor, talk about their, the transformation, talk about what the problems they had with our transformation into a co-op or the things that they didn't understand. We did a lot of little network events, uh, places where people could just come and have a meet up with a few advisors and talk amongst them what their vision for SMART was. And then we had, over the course of six months, the people who were really motivated and had the disponibility to actually help us in the process, they could participate to workshops. And so we held 21 workshops with the same people that came over and over again. And they covered the four big topics that we needed to uh, tackle before the transformation. So in the whole process, we had 2,500 people who got involved, and they wrote 37 recommendations for our legal structure. Those were published and debated, and it's upon those recommendations that we wrote the strategic plan of SMART 2020. In January 2017, the co-op became operational, and so we are a multi-stakeholder co-op. That means that our members can be stakeholders, their clients, the permanent staff of SMART, and then we also have a few um, SMART enthusiastics. We are an open co-op, everybody can join, we're de democratically governed. We are self-sustained financially and we're 
tackling a lot of issues on the transparency and how to enhance that experience because we're a quite big and complex structure. And so we need to find diverse ways of actually making sure that the information that we gather is readable and accessible to a full range of very different uh, members. In June 2017, we elected our first board. It has 18 members and is elected for four years. The votes went electronically, so people could actually vote on their smartphone. And then we are very big believers that we need to um, ease the access to the internet so people could also come to our offices, enjoy our Wi-Fi that is free since the, the very start of smart. And they could also access a computer if they didn't have a smartphone or a phone to vote online. So Smart in Progress is still running. Since September, the new work groups started over again, and they will start again for a process of six months with um, new material that will be discussed during our General Assembly in June. So we are in constant progress, and we're tackling a constant topics around the tools that we use, which tools should we use, who can access the tools, which tools are not sufficient, or um, how go we around transparency, um, what do you do with ethics, who and why should we represent uh, SMART. So it's, it's very challenging because our membership is extremely high and we need to make sure that we can answer all the diversity of the members that we are actually covering. What's important for us is that every time that we create digital, digital tools, we create them to meet the needs of our members. We are big believers that digital tools don't solve everything, that it can ease entrepreneurship and that it can ease interaction. And it can really be an excellent tool to enhance the experience of solidarity. But we should always make sure that there's a real life experience that go with there and that people could actually go and talk to a human. That's it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments? If not, ah, someone, Michelle. <laughs> um, this is an exam question uh, for Lisa. Um, so one of the things that, you know, since I started working uh, last week uh, is that you have a, a critique from some union people that SMART is a vehicle for precarity. Now, I don't see it that way. I see, you know, precarity exists and you try to, to, to make it less so and to organize, you know, salary conditions for precarious people. But just in general, how do you answer th those kinds of critiques? Because they're kind of recurrent for, uh, in, uh, in some people. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, what we always say is that it, it's not, um, we don't blame a doctor for the cancer that he's trying to cure. Um, and that, that's the way we answer those questions. We don't have a solution for what's happening to the current work conditions. It's something that is global and it's something that is going to continue to be globalized if we don't do anything to uh, prevent the erosion of the social rights. We know that the legal system, the way it exists currently, isn't sufficient and isn't answering the needs of the workers of today. But the fact is people are working today, so what do we do with the people who are working today? Do you say, oh well, someday we'll show up with a solution and everything will be better? Or you take the legal frame it exists currently and says, how can we work within the system that is existing now, whilst lobbying and doing a lot of work and talking to the unions and say, hey, have you seen the conditions of, for example, the bikers of Delivero? 
uh, there's a real problem going on here. Uh, the Deliveroo case, for example, is, is a big case within Smart for the moment because what actually happened is that we ended up covering the bikers of Deliveroo and the Take It Easy case. And that made a big debate inside the Smart organization if we should employ those people or not. And we decided that we were not the best solution for them, but that maybe we were the least worst solution for them. Because by working with us, they suddenly had more rights. We managed to negotiate better rights for them while they were working. We managed to make sure that they were covered by an insurance, which is a big thing for people who are driving under the rain on a constant basis. And whilst we were working with those people, we made sure that we started talking with the unions and saying we have a problem, this community is growing and growing and they have a lot of problems and they're part of a very extractive economy. What could we do to actually make sure that their work conditions are bettered? But then with the new legislation that just came up uh, over work, we lost that social dialogue last week and there's a lot of if the topic interested, is interesting for you, we can talk about it more in depth, but we can actually spend the afternoon on why we did it and why we believe. If, if, if we had to do it again, we would do it again. Because it's important to recreate collectiveness amongst those individual entrepreneurs. It's a good way to, to create unity amongst a very scattered workforce. And the mutualizations make sure that the, the conditions are a minimum secured for those kinds of employments. Yeah. Hi. Uh, how do you compete against commercial organizations like Zero, for example? It's, it sounds kind of like Zero. Is that right? I, I don't it's, know that it's organization. Like an on, it's an online uh, accounting system. You can also do invoices and that sort of thing. I, I don't I, know exactly how. They, I mean, there operate. are similar similar ones as well. If you're not familiar with that, but yeah. I'm just I'm, I'm just. Uh, okay, well, the the thing is, um, or I don't know the the internal way of those companies. But the thing that works very well with our company is that we take on the legal responsibility of what happens with, within us and we provide a high level of uh, service because we have a big community and everything that we earn is reinvested inside the community. So that works, we have good insurances, we take care of the debt collection and the thing that is really attracting a lot of people is that they can really use the company as if it was their own. So they can bring in their expense notes, use our VAT number as if it was their own. They have a personal advisor, so it's not just an online service. They can come to the office, talk with their advisor. And for the moment, we, we don't are aware of people who give the same level of advice and the same level of uh, service as the one that we are giving currently. That doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't exist. It's just that if we're not aware of it, it's for the moment not a problem yet. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to call it a, uh, one more question. <laughs> Sorry. That's the last yeah. one. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the last uh, uh, red cube on your on your slide is uh, the 22,000 uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 uh, creation of a status for European workers, and uh, yeah, it's, co it's connected to the the question before. So, uh, is is it some perspective around uh, uh, working on politics of employment and uh, and for people? like people in smart uh, w while working collectively with european are you connected to other cop or else that yours to, to work on this and make some lobbies uh, around this uh, well what we're trying to do is really work closer and closer with the unions because uh, there is a bigger awareness that the future of work is going towards 
uh, slashers and project-based uh, autonomous workers. And so uh, the unions are starting to look into ways of actually getting that population under their wings as well, which was not necessarily the case the past uh, 10, 20 years. Whereas that community is growing and growing. And then when you look at the way autonomous workers are supposed to work, it's absolutely not something that is perfect. Because all the social rights that had been negotiated were negotiated for people who were working for one company with a full-time contract and who would probably keep that contract for the rest of their lives. Whereas um, that is less and less true and it will be less and less true in the future. And so we have an expertise on, it's been 20 years that Smart exists, so we've been operating in this way since 20 years. We started with creatives and now we're open to a full range of uh, other people. And we want to work together with the unions who have the ability of doing more efficient lobbying than we are doing. And they have an expertise of working with uh, governments and working with all the administrational fields that are linked to um, work. And so we want to work more and more with them. But 2020 is, is our goal to say, okay, the, the next five years, this is what we're going to um, work upon, but we don't have um, political ambitions of our own. We think it should be a collective effort with cities, with uh, governments, with people who are uh, taking care of unions and the workers themselves, because they are the first ones who actually uh, need to be taken care of. One more time, thanks a lot. <laughs> We will now have a, a short lunch break. So